league uh, cabinet secretaries who are women. They're the most duplicated lot. I can think all the women who are in our cabinet today, apart from one, are PhD holders. They are more educated than the men in the cabinet. They're sharp, they're very intelligent, very talented, and they know how to navigate. So what I can really request you is that please do consider men as key allies, like those Morans on the FGF. They are key allies that you must not be able, you must never, uh, you cannot be able to make any significant debt on this problem unless you involve them. Um, this afternoon, when I uh, was coming here, I bought twin grown-up daughters who would have joined me. But I said I'm not going to bring them because uh, they know where I stand. So I decided to bring my son. <laughs> He's there. Um, so that he knows the importance uh, of really being sensitive to issues of gender. And these issues are not about women. These issues are about men. And we're talking about entry points here. My mother was an orphan from about age five. She lost both parents uh, at about that time. Now she's 87. But I know that I would be a big land owner if she was not a woman. Because her father had lots of land. But when she got married, her uncles took all the land that I should have inherited. So I'm poorer today <laughs> because of gender discrimination. Yeah, if, if that discrimination did not exist, I would be a big land owner because all the land which was left by my maternal grandfather would have been passed down to me. So I think when you talk about entry points, you should also look at ways by which men can be able to understand that they are suffering because of this sometimes. Um, when I was working on the, with the FIDA on the issue of uh, gender-based violence, when they came to my office, they called it gender-based violence. I told them, uh-uh, that's not going to work. So we changed it to domestic based violence. And one of the entry points which I put on that, uh, on the material which was the, the propaganda material we had, was, and this was a true story because we, we interviewed some lady, and she was complaining about her daughter in law who used to beat her because the, the son had died. And we, we framed that as domestic violence. So we were able to sneak this whole matter through Parliament because men are very... <laughs> um, it's always a risk you make when you ask a politician to come and talk to you. you know, <laughs> but at least uh, I just want to start by thanking you most sincerely for recognizing the, the modest work that I've done in the arena of uh, uh, gender mainstreaming in our society. I can, you mentioned the, the lesser child, which was a program I did many years ago in the early 90s, I think mean, it must have been 91, 92. And this was for UNICEF, but most of you are not yet born. Really, I was there with me. <laughs> and it was about the cow child. And the first thing I remember was doing many films that time, and there was this uh, group of men high up in society who came to my students to watch a different film which I've done. And I insisted that, look at this one. I'm going shock uh, because of the way we packaged it. And entry points are very important. So uh, Dr. Leah has just mentioned that for you to make a difference in an issue like female genital mutilation, you go further when you involve the morans. Because the, the, way, the moment the morans are, are 
are ready to fight against it. Yeah. The matter is not that. So men are your allies in dealing with the problems that we address with respect to gender. And as I was researching for this uh, film on the girl child, I think the title is The Lesser Child, and I think it's one of the most important and most successful film I did because it was adopted then by UNICEF and was used across Africa and they used it in a lot of United Nations seminars all the way in Japan, all over the world, is because there are certain little issues, like for example, just showing a baby who was just, been, who was just born, newly born, and among the Kikuyus communities, many other communities in Kenya, the girl child receives three violations. Mm -hmm. The boy child receives four. Mm -hmm. Why? Why is one child lesser than the other? Yeah. So the, dis the discrimination, because the violation is supposed to announce the gender of the child. So the boy gets four, the girl gets three. Right from the moment of birth, within minutes, they are treated as lesser citizens. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I mean, you also must think in terms of tactical approaches in dealing with this matter because of the socialization and the cultural uh, issues that determine the way men behave in our country. Once again, I told you that I yeah, uh, find it difficult to stop talking because this uh, topic which is very close to my heart. Thank you very much for recognizing the little contribution I've made and uh, I hope that I can be able to convince my son yes. to be also gender sensitive. <laughs> These things must start with the young people. When I was doing those films, first of all, I went through a lot of education, a lot of reading, a lot of socialization by women who educated me on this. And I was a very young man. I was in my 20s when I was doing this. So really, I'm hoping that we can get more young people, more young journalists um, who can actually pick this baton and make a difference in our society. Thank you very much. So I remember uh, interviewing women in, uh, in Western Kenya. Who are people? Poor families, when they had to make the difficult decision as to which child goes to school to pay school fees, and you interview this lady and she says, No, no, because the girl is going to get married, the little resources that I have in the family to pay school fees, I'll give it, I'll give priority to my son. So that maybe the girl is the first one, she's doing extremely well in school, she's reached grade four. Maybe reached, reached grade seven that time, supposed to go to high school. But then she did, reaches seven, seven, she's not allowed to go to high school because the parents or the mother feels that she will not be able to afford secondary school education for both of them. And the discrimination was in the family. Uh, there's a friend of mine, uh, she worked until recently with the United Nations system. Um, her last posting was in. South Africa or going down, don't go down. And you know, when I interviewed about this, she said one of the things that she hated most is that she had to be the house help for her brothers. Which means that in the house, she's probably the third or fourth one, but washing the clothes, cleaning of the house, uh, doing the kitchen work, and so forth. The society has uh, socialized everyone that the girl child has to do the housework. The disadvantage, even in a no normal, average, middle class family, that discrimination is there. That treatment of the girl child is right there. I want to appeal to you that a lot of this is because of our socialization. I've taken you some more than 20 years ago. Last year, all of a sudden, the MCA is in Nakuru uh, County Assembly. The 
decided that the nominated MCAs were not going to sit in committees. It was going to be only be elected. <coughs> Most of the MCAs who were nominated were nominated to fill the gender gap. So all of, and of course, in all these committees, the members, the MCAs are paid per sitting. So the moment you make the decision that the female, or rather the nominated MCAs, call it nominated, but actually it was female, because they're the ones who are mostly on the gender top up uh, list, they decided they're not going to sit in these committees. In other words, they had made a unilateral decision that the women MCAs should earn less money at the end of the month. As Secretary General, I wrote to the Speaker, asked the Majority Leader and the whole Assembly, and they refused to listen to me. They said, no, no, that's, a, that's an Assembly issue, and it is not a Jubilee issue, because both sides had agreed on that. So, you know, I had very little locus as the, as, a, as the Secretary General of Jubilee, because it concerned both sides of the House. So I talked to the Gender Commission, and we went to court. And we won. So that those women can actually be in all those committees so that they can earn the same amount of money that their male counterparts earn. They tried the same thing in Kisi, they tried the same thing in Yeri last year. But it needed somebody who is sensitive enough on, enough on these gender issues to actually deal with it. I'm not so sure that if it was another Secretary General. That, they, that kind of action uh, would have been taken. So really, because of our socialization for years and years, for centuries, I think I'd just like to appeal to you that please, please, please do everything you can to recruit more men on these issues of gender. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to be able to inform you that I think the president is very switched mm -hmm. on this. And any time he's looked as if he's forgetting, we remind him. <laughs> and I'm glad that the former Prime Minister, Elo Diga, when we were dealing with the issues of BBI, um, they were very, you know, uh, connected to, the, to this particular issue. If they were not, we would not, we would not have made the kind of progress that we made on the BBI report with respect to the issues concerning uh, Gender mainstreaming. So that's. Next year, see us, our brother, our director, Dr. Terry, who is also our mentor and our mother in many ways. Felix, Elizabeth from the office, and our brothers and sisters in the house. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Indeed, it gives me great pleasure to join you this afternoon on behalf of our CS to speak about uh, Big Brother, who it is, as Philip says, uh, it's sometimes <laughs> difficult to say who he is. But one thing just to say that if there is a person who has walked a journey, a journey, of women, a journey of a sister, a man, indeed, it's honorable. And this he started in his early days when he really worked within the region of the Western region, which is Kisumu. And many people never understood. And I was just asking him, where is the mobile clinic? Because if the black in on a then was worked very closely with many women in orphans who were HIV positive. And it was only in Rarieda, and I remember last time I had a daughter at work, and uh, just about when he was finishing, I joined the rock board, and we enjoyed many things. Today you enjoy a ferry in. Lake Victoria, coming from that side, Bondo, going to Singa Island. 
was because of Raphael's city. But then, when you look at the different journeys he has done in that city, and more importantly, I remember when, I think two years ago, you talked with us at Kepinski. And uh, I think one year ago. And you reminded us that for us to achieve the two thirds gender agenda, indeed, we must start a conversation with our male colleagues without seeing that they are our enemies in terms of us not rising to the different positions that we have. And therefore, even as we celebrate you today, I think the most thing we can learn from everything you have taught us, even when you were doing the political issues, the party of mobile, when we sat in his house and was thinking about it, I could see his women who are the ones who were given the opportunity at that time. And we see, as we talk of political parties, I think for us in political parties, if we cannot transform political parties with the process of DBI, we cannot walk a journey even as we celebrate Martha Coleman being nominated. And just recently, you remember, we had three women resigning from IEBC. And therefore, it is for us women again to sit and ensure that women are going to apply to take back those positions and we ensure we package them in a way that they will face the panel. And Kenyans nowadays are the judges anyway. 